we are there for whatever issue, whether it's skin management or helping just cheer them on and manage small things or big things, you know, to get them through these treatments. That's getting them through the treatment. And then as a patient completes the treatment, we continue the nurse education and pack the late toxicities. You're listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast, where ONS Voices Talk Cancer, a resource from the Oncology Nursing Society. Through conversations with subject matter experts, we examine the important issues in oncology nursing, from new treatments to patient-centered research to advancements in clinical practice. Join us as we hear from nurses in all facets of oncology care, from bench to bedside and everywhere in between. Welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Weimer, Manager of Oncology Nursing Practice at ONS. And today we're talking with Michelle Mitchie Gray, Radiation Oncology Care Coordinator at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, about what you should know about nursing's important role in radiation oncology. As a reminder, you can earn free NCPD contact hours after listening to this episode and completing the evaluation we've linked in the episode notes. Welcome, and thanks so much for joining us today, Mitchie. Thank you so much for having me. Well, before we jump into our conversation today, just to kind of set the stage, I think that many oncology nurses who primarily practice in the medical oncology space, you know, the subspecialty of radiation oncology feels still a little bit mysterious to us. And I will put myself in that category because I was in GYN oncology, the medical oncology piece of that. And so while we might refer our patients to radiation, or maybe even we're giving concurrent treatments, you know, systemic therapies along with radiation in some cases, I still always felt a little bit unsure of the true details of what my patient was experiencing and going through when they were sent off to radiation. You might be, some people might be fortunate enough where their medical oncology and their radiation oncology departments are housed under the same roof. You know, maybe you've been able to bridge this divide and and understand what each side of that coin looks like. But our hope today, I think, is to give that high level overview of radiation oncology, shed some light on how all nurses need to understand what their patients are experiencing in this specialty and understand also how nurses play a very important role as part of that multidisciplinary team in the radiation department. So that's kind of what we're doing. We know we can't cover every single detail about radiation from A to Z, but just kind of an overview to start things off. So let's start there at the beginning. Can you help to kind of describe and differentiate the different types of radiation or different modalities that radiation is used for patients with cancer and how those applications are different? This could be a whole entire podcast, um, <laughs> but I will <laughs> I will try and simplify it and kind of give some basic ideas of some of the radiation therapy that we use in our department. There's many different forms of therapeutic radiation. External beam radiation is probably the most common type of radiation therapy used in cancer treatments. Using... X-rays and gamma rays are types of external beam. And that is the most common and what everybody thinks of when we talk about radiation therapy. Also, particles would be another type. Particles would be electrons and protons. Then there are, there's brachytherapy. That's internal radiation, which is a technique that is sealed radioactive sources placed directly into or adjacent to the tumor. It can be placed temporarily and then removed after the prescribed dose is reached. This is used often in gynecological setting and also in sarcoma postoperatively in the or actually in the operative setting, they can go in and place interstitial tubing during the after the surgery into the open tumor bed. And then the patient comes over to us in radiation and we can do radiation therapy through those interstitial tubes. Then after they do the radiation, usually five doses, two and a half days, then the patient goes back to the operative suite where those tubes are pulled and they're closed back up. Other types would be of brachytherapy would be the permanent sealed sources such as iodine-125 used in prostate cancer. We're more familiar as prostate seeds. A lot of people will hear that, may have heard that 
with friends, family. And then there's the radio pharmaceuticals. And that is what is an unsealed source, which is a liquid or ingested or injected. Samples of that would be the iodine-131 that treats thyroid or radium-223, which is used to treat multiple bone metastasis. So there's so many different types of radiation that, you know, not just the external beam that is used in radiation therapy. Thank you for that overview. As you said, it gets much more complex and detailed, but we just kind of wanted to start with the big picture first. And so now I'm hoping you can kind of walk us through. And again, the example I'll compare it to just because that's my home base is like, if a patient is told they're going to start on a systemic treatment, a chemotherapy or immunotherapy, you know, we understand that that process is usually get them scheduled, maybe get a prior auth, hopefully get a prior auth in there. Then that order gets put sent to pharmacy. Pharmacy has to make sure they have the right drug. And then when the patient arrives on that day, we had the labs we need, the weights, we mix it up and they start off on their treatment. So similar process. Can you walk us through what that experience is like? If we say to our patient, we're going to send you to the radiation therapy department, they're going to have a consultation with you and they're going to set you up for radiation therapy. Can you walk us through kind of what that experience looks like for your team? Yeah. So first step is that consult, getting the patients in the door. Quite honestly, this consult can be a long day for the patients. They may just have a consult with the radiation oncologist. They may also, if, you know, like at the Cleveland Clinic, the patients may be coming from a distance. They may be traveling from West Virginia or they may have flown in. So they're coming in and they're seeing a multidisciplinary clinic. So they are seeing all the physicians all in one day. So they may be seeing the medical oncologist, the radiation oncologist, a surgeon. So it can be a very daunting, long day. But from a radiation standpoint, get the consult. They may or may not be fully worked up when they come to see us. They may be completely staged or not completely staged. As I mentioned before, they may still need to see the medical oncologist. They still may need to have some imaging. So depending on where they're at when they come and see us. So once we have a completely staged patient, we can then have a plan in place. So when we see this patient in consult, we may be giving a lot of what ifs, you know. We're giving the if when you're staged, it comes back and you are stage 1A or you're stage 2B. You know, we, it may be, it look like a different plan. We're giving a lot of what ifs, but we, we let them know. Again, it can be an hour long consult. It can be much longer sometimes, but we set them up for their, what we call their simulation. That is a planning CT. It is not a diagnostic CT. The CT scan, it is to get them in their treatment position. They lay on their CT scan. They are going to stay in this position. It is a position that we can replicate. Or when they come back for each of their treatments, we need to get them back, all the pieces of the puzzle back in the exact same position that they were because the doctor is taking this image and that's how he's designing their treatment plan. So they will get what we call tattoos and they are tattoos. They're little pinpricks for alignment purposes, usually three of them, and they're permanent. They are little pinpricks of ink that are permanent tattoos. If they're a head and neck patient or It's above the head and they need to be stabilized. They will actually get a mask made. It is a mesh plastic mask that is warmed up and then formed around their head and pushed down. So we do not tattoo their head or anything like that. So we'll put this mask on. It'll clip into the board, the CT board. And then if we need to put tattoos for alignment, we actually mark on that plastic mask. We use other immobilizing device to keep them In the same exact position, we have a belt. It's like a compression belt that goes across their waist. We also have a body bag. It's like a bean bag that they lay in. And so when they lay in that, it's like a Tempur-Pedic mattress. (laughs) And they lay down in it and it forms to them. And I tell them they move around and they kind of squish it up to them. They form and then it's nice and comfy. And then the therapist will suck all the air out of it, make it rock hard. 
<laughs> and form their body. Um, so it's no longer comfy. But this allows the patient then on treatment day to come back and lay in this and they get in the exact same position because they kind of shake and shimmy and get into the exact same position. So the simulation is the next step in the process. And then once the simulation is done, on this day also, they're going to be getting education. We give at the Cleveland Clinic, we give an education packet and we give education on what to expect. What to expect of the simulation before they go back. What to expect side effect treatments. We give out handouts what to expect. They meet with a clinic nurse. They meet with a care coordinator, the nurse for the physician. So they are meeting with the team, basically, on this time so they can kind of know who are all the players that they're going to have their treatment team as they go through the process. And then after that simulation, usually there's a wait period of about seven to 10 days before the treatment actually starts. And so during that time, the physician, the resident, dosimetrist, and the rest of the team are then designing the treatment plan. Of course, there's circumstances that may differ this time frame if it's an emergency. If, you know, somebody has a cord compression, if somebody has a bleeding tumor, you know, if somebody is having pain, you know, metastatic pain, there are things that where we will do a palliative dose of radiation so that we would not wait that seven to 10 days. And then treatment. Treatment starts. Once treatment starts, the patient is with us for the prescribed dose or length of their treatment plan. And that can be one treatment, a single treatment or a fraction. We use those terms interchangeably, treatment and fraction. I relate that to a pie. So if you take a pie and the pie is your total dose of radiation and you divide that up, how many treatments you're going to get or fractions you're going to get make up, you know, that total dose. So just understand that treatment and fraction mean the exact same thing. And so we do use those terms in radiation oncology interchangeably. It's one of the first things I explain to my patients because I don't want my patients, if they hear us say fraction, the word fraction, it does not mean that they're getting less of their dose or they're getting short change any amount of their prescription. It's just a term that we use. I think that's important. It does sort of have that partial connotation, like it's not the full dose or it's somehow less than. So I think you're right. That's important to clarify that term will be used, but it's just a part of the total dose, which, you know, is still the plan for that patient. Right. And then, like I said, our treatments can go anywhere from one treatment to 35, depending on the disease site and the prescription dose that the physician has given, depending on the plan. Wonderful. So before we talk specifically about nurses' role in that whole continuum of the treatment plan, let's talk a little bit more about the different players. You mentioned some of them in terms of they're just specialties that we don't necessarily have an exact equivalent in medical oncology. So can you talk us through the different players on the radiation team? And then also, of course, categorize the nurse's specific role as part of that team. So there's the radiation oncologist, the physician who oversees radiation therapy treatments. They design the plan. They are the quarterback. They are the physician. They see the patients at every OTR. They are seeing the patient for consults. They are the patient's quarterback of the entire treatment. We also, at least at the Cleveland Clinic and a lot of the teaching hospitals, there are residents that are involved in designing the treatment plan and seeing the patients as well. Then there is the radiation physicist. The physicist ensures the complex treatment plans are properly executed for each patient. They're responsible for the quality checks, and machine maintenance. There's a dosimetrist. The dosimetrist works with the radiation oncologist and the medical physicist to calculate the dose, the proper dose of the radiation, for the tumor surroundings and the organs. They're the computer geeks, for lack of better <laughs> terms. I love them dearly. They're working with the computer side of things, trying to see how that dose is coming in and playing around with when the physician designs the plan, 
And then the dosimetrist is looking at how much dose of that radiation is going to the tumor and how much is going to the healthy tissue. And can we shave that dose a little bit over here? And if we push it this way, will it move it over to a healthy organ or will it pull it away? And so they're using computer schematics to actually design that plan. They usually design one or two plans and then give it back to the physician to say, which plan do you like better? Which one looks better to you? If we pull it off of the bowel here, it's going to give a little more dose here, but we really got a good dose to the tumor. They really work side by side with the physician to, to design the treatment plan. Then there's the radiation therapist. They're the ones that are actually working back on the machine, delivering the daily treatment. They're actually in the simulation, helping set the patient up. They're on the treatment machines, the simulation. They're lining the patient up and giving that prescribed dose and supervising that prescribed dose. There's the clinical nurses, at least in our department. Some smaller hospitals, some smaller departments may not have both a clinical team and a care coordination nursing team. I can speak to our Cleveland Clinic team. This is how we operate, where we have a clinic team that oversees a lot of the clinical nursing side of things with rooming and then anesthesia recovery and things like that. And then we have the nursing working with the physicians and care coordination. We kind of have two different nursing roles within the Cleveland Clinic. So education from both sides, you know, doing education, providing care for the patients and the patient's families. Trying to think of who else is in this. It's such a big team. Um, you don't uh, think, of course, the ancillary staff, the schedulers, and the administrative assistants, those answering the phone calls and getting the messages to us. And we can't forget our social workers. They are such a huge part of our team. We definitely cannot forget them. Absolutely. And dietary staff as well. And the dietary staff. Absolutely. The nutritionists. I mean, there's just so many players that, you know, just really help us take care of our patients. Absolutely. Well, and thank you for just kind of outlining and defining those different roles. I always find it interesting when I'm trying to explain what I know or understand the difference to be, you know, I think one unique difference between if we're comparing medical oncology and radiation oncology is in the radiation oncology space, we do have some of these other players, dosimetrist, physicist, radiation therapist, all sort of professional roles. And they are truly the ones that are sort of creating and administering the actual radiation treatment. So nurses don't typically kind of live in that space back by the machine. But nurses have a very important and distinct role despite that. And so I think that's one ways in which these our two specialties kind of separate a little bit. I also am always fascinated in just the complexity of, as you mentioned, the computer modeling, all of the software and technology that supports that treatment planning and how it is linked directly both to the machine and to the medical record system that is used. And so we're making, I think, making progress in the medical oncology space. And, you know, our infusion pumps can now sometimes interface with our medical records and our medication administration records so that those things do can automatically populate now. But a lot of places still, it's the nurse manually is typing in, here's the dose, here's the rate. So the technology, because I think of, again, the risk, the high risk of the radiation treatment itself and just all of the other safety measures that have to be in place, how much of that truly is built and driven and delivered through the technology systems that are in place to help design all that, which I think is just very interesting to consider. That's very funny that you mentioned that. This is one of the many phone calls that we get, I should say, almost daily, we get several phone calls from patients who say, I've looked at my chart. I don't see my radiation treatments. Why are they no longer there? I don't see them. What's going on? And it is because I've got this. You've got the spiel memorized. <laughs> Locked and loaded. <laughs> it's like your radiation treatments do not interface with my chart. You will be given a handout when you come. And because there is an issue with the system we use, we use a different system for the computerized radiation treatments. And then we use a different system for our computer charting and they do not interface. They do not like each other. 
So all of their radiation treatments do not show up in their my chart. They do not show up in their computer system. Their doctor's appointments show up, but their radiation treatments do not show up. And so the patient's told they have this appointment to show up on this day, and then it doesn't show up in there when they go to look. It's not there. Um, so we get many phone calls um, re- and we have to reassure them, please come. We will give you a paper chart. We will show you. You've got a calendar. Come on these days. We tell this is education on that simulation day that it will be like this, but they're overwhelmed. You know, they have a lot that they're thinking about. And this is just one of those things that it goes over their head or they just don't hear. And I get it. Well, and I think, you know, obviously the the impact to the patient is certainly significant, creating an opportunity for miscommunication or for them to not understand, you know, what their schedule is. But certainly when you bring that back to the nurses, I mean, I've we've lived that life. I've lived that life as a, as a clinic nurse and I pull up the schedule and I'm like, I don't know when your radiation is scheduled. I can't see into that. Yeah. System. <laughs> I don't have the access. And so it unfortunately creates an environment where it seems like we're not talking to each other when that's not necessarily true. It's more of just when we can't all access the same information. And this, okay, another podcast, another topic for another day. But yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think this is a place when, when our two specialties, medical and radiation oncology, are interfacing, when we're having patients, we're sharing on both sides, either concurrently or kind of handing off. This is a huge gap that I think is important for nurses to be aware of and, and to understand how can I communicate with that team, with whoever the other team is, to understand where can I find your information in my electronic health record? Is there a place I can access it? If not, what's the best way for me to, you know, reach out to your team and ask these questions or get clarification for our patient? Because at the end of the day, we ultimately want to make sure the patient has the right information and that we are informed of the patient's plan as well. Um, so yeah, this could last another hour if we just want to talk about electronic health records and systems. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's a notable problem just to bring up and just how that impacts our patients and our care teams when we don't have that visibility into each other's systems and plans. Because it can impact, you know, documentation as well, you know, notes on treatment visit notes, being able to see that daily, you know, plan, how they're progressing through their treatments and and where they are in their fractions and what are the notes from the doctor when they saw them that day. You know, if there's not visibility on both sides, puts us all at a disadvantage. So as we pull it back to the nurse, and so nurses are certainly a critical part of interacting and not only helping to um, kind of as a conductor, I see, it's like they kind of have to know all the pieces and parts that are in motion, who is responsible for doing what, and then translating that information to the patient. So can you talk us through um, how you see the nurse's role as they are kind of walking with their patient through their treatment plan? How does the nurse's role follow that patient along this continuum? As I mentioned before, you know, the radiation treatments vary in duration. The patient can have as few as a single fraction or as many as 35. They are typically Monday through Friday. However, depending on the treatment location, they can be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, Tuesday. And then the nurse is seeing that patient for what we call an on-treatment visit. We use the term OTV. We also use on-treatment review or OTR. So we'll use those also interchangeably because we like to keep things a little confusing and call the same thing different things, OTV, (laughs) OTR. You know, just for the lay person, just to keep them on their toes. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, so we're seeing those patients every week just to see how they're doing or how they're tolerating treatment, if they're having any side effects of treatment, if we need to help manage any of those side effects, and kind of like their cheerleader, their mom. You know, I says, I'll push you, I'll pull you, I'll walk beside you. You know, you tell me what you need me to do. And sometimes don't tell me, I'll tell you what you need me to do for you. Then also we have the scheduled weekly meetings, but our patients have access to us every single day of the week. Because they're there getting treatment every single day. They know that they can walk up to the nurse's station and ask for a nurse visit if they're having an issue. So it's not just They are scheduled to see us every Friday or every Wednesday. If they have an issue on Monday where all of a sudden they've got esophagitis over the weekend and they're not getting fluids in, they're not eating because they're having pain with swallowing, 
because we're treating their esophagus and it hit it's week three their esophagitis has started they can no longer get nutrition in and they're starting to get dehydrated we've told them don't wait to friday to stop by and talk to us you stop in and so they go to the nurse's station and we get paid we come down we have a nurse visit with them so they know that they have access to us pretty much every day of the week and some of these patients We'll stop in four or five times a week. So we are there for whatever issue, whether it's skin management or helping just cheer them on and manage small things or big things, you know, to get them through these treatments. That's getting them through the treatment. And then as a patient completes the treatment, we continue the nurse education and talk the late toxicities. So we've got the acute toxicities. As they're going through the treatment, they're in it, they're in the middle of it. And then there's the late toxicity. So that last on-treatment visit, we review what could possibly happen after they finish treatment and what could happen a few months, six months, 12 months after the radiation is completed. And then we also go over what the follow-up plan is going to look like. When are you going to see the physician? When do we need you to come back? When do you need to have imaging? We're going over that with them. Within the first two weeks, at least at the Cleveland Clinic, our plan is to give those patients a call back, see how they're doing, how they're doing with their side effects, have they got scheduled for their follow-up, do a check-in. Some of our patients have tox visits at six weeks with their nurse care coordinators, and that's just to check and see if they're having any lingering side effects as well. And then. We continue to get calls. For example, I spoke with a patient today. He is four months after his radiation treatment. He completed on October 27th. I was talking to him today. He still got this lingering cough. So I was talking to him today. After talking with him, we were talking and his wife then gets on the phone and she goes, yeah, but he's also fatigued. And he also hasn't cut out of the house in two weeks. He's just not himself. And he also has this and he also has that. So we have a plan now to bring him back in. We're going to have him see palliative medicine. We're going to talk to his pulmonologist, you know. So this is a patient who is now four months after his radiation treatment. The acute side effects are over. We haven't quite came up with, you know, he's due for his next scans. But, you know, kind of in that in-between zone, you know, we continue with these patients. I've got patients that it's been six years. I'm still getting phone calls, <laughs> you know, there's still my follow-up that, you know, it's just uh, like, okay, it may just be, hey, can you help me schedule my follow-up with the physician? That may all be it is, or they may have a new nodule and I'm getting them set up again, you know, so they're my patients forever. We just continue with them. You know, they're ours. They're on my patient list and my patient list just keeps growing. (laughs) Well, you know, and I'm struck by a couple of things as I listen to you talk. I think when you were talking through how patients, you know, can stop by the desk if they're having, you know, new acute symptoms or side effects that are appearing. Yes, there's a weekly scheduled visit with a physician, but anytime they need to talk to a nurse, there's a nurse there to take that information in and to kind of help assess and evaluate what's happening And it does bring to mind the importance, and I suppose we have this in medical oncology as well, but making sure patients understand who's on the team and what their role is, because I think it might be easy for them to assume that everyone is a nurse. Their their radiation therapist isn't, there's a nurse, and they just, if we don't clarify the roles and kind of what we're there to do to help support them through their treatment. Now, certainly if they turn to their radiation therapist and say something about a new side effect, I would hope and assume that there would be a communication pathway either from that therapist back to the nurse or telling that patient, please stop by the nurse's desk and talk to them on the way out. But nevertheless, I think it does just highlight the importance of identifying and clarifying who is on their team and what their primary roles are so the patient isn't confused. And so I think that's something that really struck me as you were talking through just how the nurses are there to respond to some of those acute side effects. And then as you kind of opened it up to more of understanding that as those acute side effects are you know managed or subside, that the long-term ones start to kind of generate over time. And so it's equally important, likely after radiation, they are probably going back to a medical oncologist, at least as part of their ongoing follow-up care. And so 
that patient will then, as she said, forever be managed by both camps, both radiation and medical oncology, depending on kind of if there's more systemic treatment to happen after their radiation or just long-term kind of survivorship maintenance and follow-up. But it's important for oncology nurses who do work in medical oncology to understand what symptoms that they might see in these patients that technically are related to their radiation and not something related to any systemic treatment they're getting. And so that's not always going to be a black and white cut and dry answer. But I think we have to be aware and familiar with what those long-term side effects are so that if the patient comes to us with them and when we're giving them a systemic therapy, we might be like, well, that's not from this. Well, we need to be able to connect that to what other therapies they've received. And so as you said, they will likely still have follow-up with the radiation team to be able to talk through those things, but maybe they'll see the medical oncology team a few weeks before then. And so we just all have to be aware of kind of what the other team is doing or has done and so that we can connect those dots for the patient as well. Absolutely. So another component, and you alluded to this early on in just describing some of the various ways that radiation can be delivered, but there's even, I would say, significant collaboration outside kind of the walls of the department, if you will. You mentioned that sometimes radiation is either implanted or some of the devices that are used are positioned during surgery. So you're having to work with the surgical staff and the OR. Our radiology is used significantly to do scans. Sometimes they have the machines are actually based in the radiation department, but sometimes you're rolling patients down the hallway to use main radiology equipment. And so you're having to then interface with the radiology department. As you mentioned, radiopharmaceuticals, and sometimes that overlaps with the nuclear medicine department. Some patients get an implant and they're inpatient for a while, or they have some, you know, while that implant is in place before it's removed, they're staying in either recovery or they're in an inpatient unit for that sort of observation. So can you talk to me a little bit about how the nurse can serve as the facilitator for that communication among all these different disciplines and helping the patient kind of stay the center of that discussion and that focus when it is kind of going here, there and everywhere? We do that quite a bit. We are, as I mentioned before, the uh, physician is a quarterback. The nurse is the manager of the team. <laughs> We're the general manager and we do. It is football season, so we can, yes. I, use, I use that analogy. We talk to a lot of the different teams. We get a lot of different phone calls from the medical oncologist, from the care coordinators, the nurse, from the medical oncology team from the surgical team, what I would say is get to know those other players, get to know those other team members, write their names down, have a notebook. I work with sarcoma and I know the surgeons in the sarcoma world and their nurses very well. I actually have their names by their first names in my cell phone and I can reach out to them if I need them. It's gotten to the point where we're a very close-knit team. Once you have that type of connection with your teams, then you really have a great team to where they can also reach out to me. It's like, we've got this patient. He's coming in from Alabama. He's coming in on this day. Can your physician see him on Friday at 9 a.m.? And I'll look at the schedule and I'll say, no, but he can see him at 10, you know, <laughs> you know, and can we do a brachytherapy case in the OR on this day? No, he's going to be out of town talking in Abu Dhabi. But how about we do this day instead? You know, and so we can coordinate and we can work together and we can do what's best for the patients. Likewise, with I also work with a lung physician and communicating with those teams, even though they are just one floor above me in the same building. It's a lot of emails, a lot of communicating through the computer, messaging through our, we use Epic, using the messaging system that we have through Epic, picking up the phone and just calling, Mitchie, what's going on with this patient? Or just paging me and saying, hey, give me a call back. Can we set up chemotherapy and radiation, you know, on the same day for these patients? Listening to tumor board, if you have the patients, so you know what patients that are going to be coming down the pike because you've heard all the physicians discussing these cases. So you know 
the plan because you've heard the surgeon, the radiation oncologist, the medical oncologist discuss the case. So you know kind of what the plan is and you can kind of get an idea, hey, this one might be coming to me soon and maybe I should be watching out for this patient or discussing this with my physician if I haven't seen it. So listening to the tumor reports, if you get a chance to do that, if you have an opportunity. Absolutely. I learned so much. Again, I was just mainly absorbing information at tumor boards. I wasn't actively speaking necessarily every time. But as you said, hearing names, hearing treatment plans, understanding, I think so much. And this is true for, I think, in radiation, in ambulatory care and medical oncology, I mean, in any nursing, I suppose, is that it's, I think, a critical feature as yes, of course, communication, but also anticipation of understanding based on a growing body of, of knowledge and expertise and kind of how certain treatments are given or planned for or anticipated. It's just that it's that little key of like, I think this is what usually happens next and validating that that is the plan and then being able to set things up and put things in motion, if not ahead of time, at least very efficiently, as soon as you kind of get whatever signal or green light you need to kind of move things along and creating that efficiency because you were able to identify what the situation was, anticipate whether it's the patient's need or the care team's need or coordinating, you know, trying to hand off information from one group to the next. As you said, sometimes it's that general manager of trying to see all the pieces in motion and understanding when to intervene, when to notify one team of what's happening next. And that really is a critical feature. And, and you know, whether it's you're a care coordinator, you're a navigator, whatever your official title is, it's that sort of pivotal point person that can really help create a great experience for the patient because they're seeing all the pieces kind of interact and connect and trying to kind of keep communication flowing in both directions so that everybody stays on that same page. Absolutely. And so a final question in our time today, I do just want to go back to the patient education needs, which you have touched on a couple of times during our talk. But what do you, would you say are maybe some of you know your top education points that you try to emphasize to patients, maybe not only at the start of their treatment, but throughout its duration as they work their way through their radiation treatment plan? I think with any patient, you know, their education need changes as they go along. At the very beginning, they may not be absorbing the information. So their education needs are simple. Tell me what I need to do. Step one, step two, where do I need to be? When do I need to be there? You can give them the education as far as the simulation, what to expect. We educate them on the possible side effects. They may not be absorbing it. They may not be understanding it until they actually start having some of those side effects. So again, what we do is as they're going through those treatment, each one of those on treatment visits, we're asking them about the side effects. We're then going over the possible side effects again, the acute side effects with them, educating them again on what may happen this week what may happen, you know, what you might be experiencing this week to the next week. And then educating as they finish treatment. Okay, you finish treatment. That does not mean everything is done. You're done and it's over. This just means that you've stopped driving down to clinic every single day <laughs> getting radiation. <laughs> that does not mean that the side effects are over and educating them so that they are aware that they may still have. I say it's like the sunburn, you know. It's not the day that you're in the sun that's the problem. It's the days after you get sunburned that then tend to be the problem. That's when the actual blistering and the pain happens. So it's those days afterwards that actually the patient's like, I'm done with radiation. This is the worst it's going to be. But in reality, it can be those days afterwards after they finish that actually can be the worst. So letting the patients know that and that we're still only a phone call away and, you know, we're there for them. So, you know, continuing to educate also on when to call us, when to call, when to show up in clinic. We're there. We will get them an appointment. We will get them hydrated. We will do whatever they need. So I think that's the big things for them is educating them to know that we're still their safety net. 
Well, Mitchie, thank you so much. You've shared a lot of great information. As I said, when we started off, this is only going to scratch the surface. So, Oh, it is. <laughs> so much more that we could talk about. But for today's episode, as we reach the end, we do like to run through just a few sort of quick fire questions to help summarize some of the main points that we've talked about. So to start that off, our first question is, how do you think nurses and other healthcare providers or professionals should evaluate maybe their own hidden or implicit bias concerning kind of their role in radiation oncology? Here is my initial gut reaction when I saw this question. I think that nurses, again, I'll speak for myself. I think it's often that like, oh, well, that's their problem. That's radiation. That doesn't involve me because I don't, I'm don't. i not in that department. I'm over here in med onc. I think that's something that nurses could kind of check themselves on is to recognize that it is a different treatment modality, but the management of that patient, their symptoms and side effects, both acute and long-term will overlap in the care that I provide. And so that's something just to be aware of, to just not assume that it's not going to impact my role as part of that patient's care team. What are some common misconceptions about radiation oncology? I think the most common misconception, and I will speak to what patients' misconceptions are, and that is you do not glow in the dark. Right. And for the most part, you are not radioactive. And I say for the most part, and that is because with the exception of the implanted brachy seeds, or the ingested isotopes, which at the time your team will go over the limitations that you will have. You know, you walk out of external beam radiation, you are not radioactive, you're not going to set off any Geiger counters. The other misconception is everyone does not get radiation burns. You know, yes, the old radiation of the day, people were more inclined to get the radiation burns. But with the new treatments and with new computer systems and how we can get the high dose of radiation to the tumor deeper away from the skin surface, the technology allows us to aim the radiation much more precisely and avoid damaging that healthy skin tissue. So people are more likely not to get the radiation burns. Now, the exception would be Our breast cancer patients, our head and neck cancer patients, they do tend to still get some of those radiation burns, but we, again, can manage those much better nowadays. What's something about this topic that's not often discussed, but you wish people knew more about? Radiation therapy is not only used to treat cancers and malignant conditions. It is also used to treat quite a few benign conditions, arthritic knees, BTAC in cardiac patients. Dupuytren's contractures, if you've watched the commercials that they're showing all over now. So the Dupuytren's contractions of the hands and even plantar warts. So we use a lot of radiation therapy to treat these benign conditions. So it's not just malignant cancers. I definitely did not know all of those options. (laughs) Yeah, I know. We're pretty cool. What additional training or education do oncology nurses need to help stay current in this topic? See if your local ONS chapter has educational opportunities. I know the Cleveland ONS chapter does at least one radiation-focused education each year. There's many resources. The ONS website, ONS has got a lovely book that was just updated. There's a lot of education, and most of that education is hands-on and on-the-job training. We currently have of our nine care coordinators at the Cleveland Clinic, only two of us originally came from an oncology world. The other seven came from outside of the oncology world. Two came from labor and delivery. One came from home health. One came from hospice. So that's close. They're coming from other departments and they've now fallen in love with radiation oncology. And It's lovely. It's a lovely place to work. Wonderful. (laughs) And finally, what are some additional resources maybe for patients uh, that want to learn more? So patients and their caregivers can find additional resources and information on the American Cancer Society website, Livestrong website. Nurses can also put them in touch with a social worker and in their hospital and their clinics and determine exactly what their needs are. The social workers are a great resource. 
they have a lot of information and resources to help guide you and find the needs that you, the patients may need that the nurses may not even have information on. So those social workers are a lifesaver. Absolutely. Well, Mitchie, thank you again. I appreciate your time and just sharing all of your experience and your knowledge with us today. Do you have any final comments you'd like to share with our listeners? I'd like to to say radiation oncology is a hidden gem. We are usually hidden down in the basement. (laughs) So if you do get a chance to shadow a radiation oncologist, if you are an inpatient nurse, an infusion nurse, a medical oncologist, you know, ask to shadow a radiation oncology nurse. Just call, ask your manager and just spend an hour or two hours do it on treatment visit day so you can kind of see what we do and how we interact with our patients and spend a little bit of time down in the basement with us. You know, just kind of see what we actually do down there because we are a hidden gem. I love it. Great advice. Thank you so much, Mitchie. Thank you for listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Tell us about your favorite part in this episode by leaving a review wherever you download your podcast. For more resources and information about oncology nursing, visit us at ons.org or voice.ons.org. The ideas and opinions shared in this episode represent those of the guest and not necessarily ONS.